thank you for the presentation. Hello, everybody. Um, so, presentation are done. I'm Michele. Is Lucas? Feel free to ask us any question, not just at the end, but feel free to interrupt us too if you have any question or something is unclear. So we're gonna talk about the content security policy. So we'll first say what is content security policy, uh, what are its aims, and then we'll inspect the policy. We'll see what's inside the policy. So we'll dissect the policy. We'll see the directives. We'll see what which. Uh, what is controlled by each. Then we'll, uh, let's say, wear the, like the breaker hat and we'll try to break uh, policy. So we'll talk about common mistakes in um, deploying content security policy. And then we'll talk about bypassing it, maybe not just for a mistake, uh, because of a mistake of somebody, but because maybe something is inherently flawed in the current model. And then we'll try to fix it. We'll. Uh, present a new way of doing CSP, which in our view is a huge improvement uh, our, um, with respect to the current state. And we'll discuss the future of CSP, uh, its limitations, and some success stories. So what's CSP? So um, CSP is a tool that web developers can use to lock down their web applications in many, way, in many ways. So, it has to be said that it's very important that, uh, to note that CSP is a defense in depth mechanism. This means it is a second layer of defense and it reduces the harm of uh, uh, malicious markup injection, but it's not to be um, considered a replacement for actually fixing the bug. So for uh, input validation or mostly input validation, but also output encoding, right? It's very important. We're talking about a mitigation here. And it is an ambitious project because uh, it has three ma main aims. So the first one is to mitigate risk. So basically uh, a web developer has uh, fine grade control on what its web application can um, uh, request, embed and execute. So by resource type, it can reduce the privilege in, uh, uh, of the application itself. So. Uh, if you have in mind, for example, the sandbox attribute uh, for iframe in HTML5, well, CSP can be considered like kind of a sandbox attribute for other elements and other resources too. And uh, lastly, but not least, uh, it can be a useful tool for detecting exploitation. So this means that it has a reporting mode where um, the web administrator is actually notified of violations of such policies. So when the web application is basically behaving in an unexpected way. So, uh, sometimes uh, the, um, let's say, most of the policy are actually pretty noisy, so they generate a lot of reports. So this actually, this monitoring part uh, is not uh, as, uh, not being used enough uh, in our view uh, so far. And so it couldn't be used, for example, for alerting, so for sending alerts in case of exploitation. But it is a part of CSP that is surely uh, worth exploring uh, in, in the future. So CSP has a lot of directives, and each directive uh, aims to control a different resource type. So for example, image source governs images, uh, font sources, fonts, uh, child SRC, uh, well, frames, but more in general, nested browsing contexts, so uh, also workers. Um, with frame ancestors, for example, you can say, I want my web application to be framed just by some particular origins. Uh, with plugin types, you can choose the MIME type of plugins you want to allow to run on your website. So you can say, well, I want to run Flash. Don't do that if you can. But I don't want to run Java, for example. Style for style and so on. Report URI is for reporting, but we'll focus on script SRC because we want to talk about CSP as a mitigation against cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, which are uh, still the number one vulnerability in the web. So we'll focus on that. And what is CSP? CSP is an HTTP header. Actually, it's two CSP, uh, HTTP headers. Content security policy with dashes. Um, if it is in an enforcing mode, so it, if it actually blocks the uh, uh, fetch of the resources, resources that are not allowed by the policy, or content security policy report only if it's actually in 
just reporting mode, so it does not actually block the resources that are not allowed, but it still sends a report to the web administrator for later investigation. So let's see a policy in detail. Like this is a very simple example. So you have on money.example.com you have a, an image image source cat.png, and you have this content security policy. So default SRC is the catch-all bucket. This means if you don't have a more specific directive that governs your resource, ta resource type and you specify a default SRC, then the default SRC governs that. So for example, here we don't specify IMG SRC, so image source, we just specify script source. So this means that images are governed by default SRC. So default SRC, self, self is a special keyword that means same origin. So allow resources from the same origin. Then we have script SRC, self, and yep.com. This means allow scripts from the same origin and from yep.com. And then you have a report URI for violation. So cat.png is on the same, it's a relative URL, right? It's on the same origin, so it's allowed by CSP. We have script SSC, yep.com, x.js, and it's also allowed by content security policy because you explicitly uh, declared yep.com as allowed in the script SSC directive. But what happens if an attacker injects some markup, like such as this one, you know, the usual getting out of the tag, and then script us to see his sources from his evil domain, attacker.com. That's blocked because attacker.com is a source which is not whitelisted in script SRC, and it sends a report to a CSP evaluation logger, which is the report URI. Same if, you just try, if the attacker tr just tries to uh, inject a script tag, like alert42. It's also uh, blocked because inline scripts are not allowed. So by default, uh, script, script something and the script are not allowed with, uh, unless a uh, very special keyword we'll not talk about too much uh, here, which is called unsafe in line. We talk about it when we uh, talk about fallbacks, but this is an unsafe as the um, keyword name tells. So this is also blocked and a report is sent. Um, I'm gonna show you a very uh, quick demo of this, uh, just focusing on the image. So let's specify a policy with image source self. Can you see that? Yeah. And let's load the cat. So the cat loads correctly. But if the applications try to load evil.com cat JPEG as an image, you can see that the browser refused to load the image. It's even before it tries to fetch it, right? It's not fetched because it violates the content security policy IMG SRC itself. Okay? Awesome. Thank you very much for the intro, Mickey. Um, so, CSP, in theory, is a very promising mitigation technique, right? As we saw, it is probably one of the most promising mitigation techniques for script execution, like pre preventing unwanted script execution, right? But in practice, it's really hard to deploy at the current state. And so we picked two examples from Twitter and Gmail. Uh, but before we were looking at these, I wanted to ask you guys, like, how many of you guys have heard about CSP before? Awesome. <laughs> uh, how many of you have tried to come up with a CSP for like some application. Cool, cool. So I guess some of you will be like familiar with what you will be seeing now, right? So usually if you have like a somehow medium sized application, you will end up with a really long policy. In this screenshots, we actually only have script source directives. Uh, it's a bit unreadable unfortunately, but it doesn't really matter because it's unsecure anyway. Uh, but the takeaway is it's very long. It's very hard for the developer to come up with this initial set of whitelisted origins. And at the same time, it's still bypassable, right? Which is very unfortunate. Um, so actually, a lot of policies in the web look like these. We analyzed like 1.6 million policies from the web. And we were able to bypass between 90 and 99% depends how you count them, right? So this is like significant, right? 
it really tells us like that the current state is uh, not really working, unfortunately. So we will look into that, why this is the case, and afterwards we'll also look into how we think we can fix this. So, how did we break CSPs, right? Um, first of all, start with some common mistakes. It's like very trivial, just for the sake of completeness, I'll add it because still, it's trivial, but many CSPs break because of this, right? So, and if you say breaking, we mean like in the context of preventing unwanted script execution. So, there's still a lot of policies out there which just allow unsafe inline, which basically totally removes the uh, script XSS, whatever protection, right? So, an attacker could just inject something like that, like normal attack XSS string, right? It's like if CSP wouldn't be there. Uh, same for default source if there's no object source. So, this is trivial, right? Another trivial one, people add uh, scheme uh, schema as a source like uh, HTTPS, data, or wildcards like star. Again, you can't do inline script, but you can source your script from wherever, right? So it's basically no protection again. So you could, for example, uh, say like source it from attacker.com slash evil.js and it will execute again, right? Uh, again, very trivial. Uh, same holds true for object source, by the way. Um, so, a little bit less trivial, but we also saw this quite often. Uh, for example, people restrict uh, the script SRC, right? Maybe to none or like super restrictive. But then they, forgot, they forget to add default source or object source, so an attacker could just inject the object tag and allow script access, and he will have like full script uh, execution again, right? And maybe even less obvious, uh, self is sometimes a problem as well. It's hard to like verify that automatically because it really depends on what your origin actually is serving. But for example, if your application is hosted on a big domain together with other applications, or if you host user-provided data on your domain, or you have some weird error messages that allow you to echo back uh, strings, right, on your same domain, all of this potentially can be used to completely bypass the CSP as well, right? Um, so, for example, if you have a user upload, right, you could, for example, uh, include a, a script file like that from the same domain, same origin. So, uh, let's get to the real bypasses, right? Again, this is probably not really new, but it is actually really interesting how many CSP policies we were able to break in the internet because of these uh, errors, right? Uh, there's actually like 75, around 75% 75 of Unix CSPs we could find, we could bypass with whitelist bypasses like this and the next one, right? This is actually really uh, significant, like 75% just because of this bug. And the other, like, uh, 20% were like because of other uh, problems which we have been shown before, right? So, how would a bypass look for this? Look, would look like for this instance, right? Uh, like its problem is basically JSMP. Uh, whitelisted.com is allowed, and then you have a callback, and the attacker can more or less specify what the JSMP endpoint will echo back to the browser, right? So, if we look into like, if you look at that a bit into detail, right, this is pretty cool. Um, an attacker would source, like, whitelisted.com slash JSMP callback alert one, semicolon. JSMP would say, sure, whitelisted.com is whitelisted, so go ahead. Whitelisted.com will just echo back the callback string, right, and since it's in a, uh, in a script tag, I'll just execute. So, that's bad. Uh, one could say that usually, or quite often, the char set is restricted for JSMP attacks. Um, thankfully, it is getting more and more that people actually try to restrict the char set of the JSMP responses. But you could still do something which is called like a sum attack, like same origin method execution. And basically what you can do is you can uh, trigger events and by that simulate like arbitrary user interaction on the page or other pages. and 
is almost equivalent to full script execution, right? Because you basically cannot do whatever the user can do. And yeah, so this is definitely bad as well, right? Uh, so uh, we'll see a demo in a second. But one thing I want to point out, these JSONP endpoints are not rare, right? They are usually at the CDNs, at like, you know, Twitter, Google, like everywhere where you would put uh, widgets and you would like source them in your application. So you would put them in the whitelist, right? Uh, which is very problematic. Uh, Mickey will give us a short demo of how this uh, JSONP attack actually would look like in the browser. So JSONP and JSONP endpoints have a special place in my heart. They are really a useful tool for attackers. Uh, they used to be in the past that they keep giving. Uh, as, as Lucas said, they are really common, so they are uh, still there uh, in most uh, APIs because a lot of APIs still allow a callback something uh, for actually passing data across domains. So there is course, course works well, but still uh, we, design, so we still design APIs with JSONP, and this is very unfortunate. Basically, what we're saying now is that we can't whitelist CDNs as script sources, which is pretty bad. You, you, you can't uh, script ajax.googleapis.com, for example, which is one of the most important CDNs, just because it hosts JSONP endpoint. So I want to show you um, Google Maps APIs. Google Maps APIs are source from maps.googleapis.com. I hope you can read, yes. So this is it. So maps.googleapis.com slash maps slash API JS. Then there is a key and then there is a callback. So it's still, this is a recent uh, API. So this is dynamic, right? I mean, this is a, a widget. And still it has a callback, right? So What we can do is we just whitelist maps to googleapis.com and we now it will pause because init map does not exist. So here instead of instead of putting in it map, I just put alert. And what happens is that alert gets executed. Why? Because this source script, this could be an ejection by an, an attacker, right? An attacker could just see that maps to googleapis.com is allowed. And then what you can do is maps to googleapis.com, then an API, and then yeah, it doesn't need to put the key, of course, uh, call back something, right? That would be the beginning of the response. It would be alert, open parenthesis, some data inside. Usually, you can't really put the whole vector like this and then, you know, exfiltrate things. But what you can do is, as, as Lucas said before, you could create like some mm, gadgets and you can interact with uh, DOM elements in the page. So you can, for example, if you have an element called X, you can do X click and it would click. So you can still do a lot of uh, damage. And this is the problem with uh, JSONP. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, another interesting bypass is uh, just loading an Angular library. Doesn't sound too bad, right? But actually, if you whitelist an origin, an origin where Angular is hosted, or even self, when you host Angular yourself, right? Um, an attacker could just load the library, and then uh, when Angular is loaded, he can do whatever Angular can do, right? He can, for, for example, uh, inject uh, a source uh, uh, Angular expression, do some arithmetics, which is quite boring. So instead, he could do like uh, ng click and do alert like that. Or you could even combine it with uh, uh, other frameworks like Prototype.js, and you could load Angular then you load prototype JS, and then you do like uh, Angular expression on curry call, which will give it a window object, and then you would do alert one, right? So uh, at the beginning, you're kind of restricted to 
the Angular expression context, but Angular has like a sandbox bypass for every version. So you again, it's very likely that you will get full script execution, right? Why does it work? Uh, it's very trivial, right? Because whitelisted.com is whitelisted, so CSP will say, yeah, sure, load, ang lo load Angular from whitelisted.com. And then Angular adds an abstraction layer on top of JavaScript, right? It's like a GVM or something like that. And then everything which is happening in Angular, right, in the Angular expressions, CSP doesn't care anymore, right? Because it's not JavaScript, basically, right? So, yeah, that's a big problem. Uh, again, Angular is hosted on most, most CDNs, right? And which means you put the CDN in the whitelist, you probably will have problems, right? Um, some of this was taken from uh, Mario's like Q53 mini challenge. There's like a lot more examples like that on the site. It's really recommend, like I really recommend to go there and check out the examples. It's really awesome. Um, yo. And next is something which is maybe surprising for some of you. Uh, it's like a path relaxation attack due to open redirect. So assume you have a policy that is able to whitelist every single JavaScript file, which you will see not very often in practice because it's just extensive, right? You will get a policy like, I don't know, two pages long, right? Because and it's changing and sometimes it's dynamic so you can't really do it. But assume you could whitelist every file in the CSP, right? And assuming you're not whitelisting any JSMP endpoints, right? Let's say Secure has not a JSMP callback. Um, and then you also whitelist some endpoint which has an open redirect, you could do this following. So this would not work, right? CSP would say, nope, whitelisted.com slash JSONP is not whitelisted, so it will not load. But an attacker could do the following. He could uh, source it from the open redirect whitelisted origin and let the redirect URL point to the uh, JSMP endpoint, which is also on whitelisted.com, but it's not totally secure, uh, .js. And basically what happens is that CSP allows a uh, site with redirect.com because it's a whitelist, right? But then when whitelisted.com redirects to, uh, sorry, when site with redirect.com redirects to whitelisted.com slash totally slash, uh, sorry, to the, JSMP callback, which is also on the whitelisted domain, but not whitelisted, uh, CSP will drop the information of the path, right? C CSP will only validate that after the redirect, the domain matches, right? This is something which was added to the spec in response to uh, Homakov's uh, using CSP for evil. He basically was able to read out sensitive data, I think like session tokens, stuff like that, by using CSP. So it was, they had to fix it in a way that after the redirect, the path is not uh, considered anymore, right? Uh, unfortunately, this makes like whitelists using like full paths uh, much less uh, secure. So uh, TLDR, whitelisted based CSPs are really hard to come up with to maintain and they are very often bypassable, which is really bad because CSP has some really great security uh, guarantees if you do it right, right? So, uh, for, so CSP is very complex already, right? Uh, it has been growing and it is really, really easy to make mistakes if you don't read the spec closely. So we actually are building a tool that shows all the pitfalls, uh, bypasses, deprecated stuff to the developers. So you just paste the CSP and we'll tell you where you have problems, which directives will be ignored in a certain version of CSP, and so forth, uh, and so forth. So it's not released yet, but hopefully we'll be able to release it soon. Yeah, so um, as you guys saw, the whitelist-based approach is really hard to make secure. So we and Mike and Arthur and some other folks from Chrome and from other teams actually sat together and tried to figure out how we could improve the situation, right? And we basically 
s uh, came to the conclusion that the whitelist-based approach is kind of broken. So we thought it would be very nice if we could instead just use nonces, right? Uh, nonces are, have been added in CSP 1.1, but didn't really take off. I think like only 1% of CSPs in the web use nonces. And basically, the script is only, a uh, script tag in the page is only executed if the nonce value matches the nonce in the CSP header, which is uh, a fresh random nonce for every response. So it should not be guessable by the attacker. Um, a nonce-based CSP is actually awesome because you don't have to come up with the whitelist in the first place, you don't have to maintain it, and you don't have to be scared that your CSP is breaking because your whitelist is not up to date. And most importantly, you won't have this problem with like JSMP and Angular um, whitelist bypasses because there is no whitelist. Uh, so what's the catch? Why isn't not everyone using non-space CSPs already? The problem is, it's unfortunately not how the web works, right? Most widgets or things you load, right, uh, dynamically source other uh, JavaScript files. For example, like a very popular approach is like module loading, right? You source one file and JavaScript file, and this JavaScript file will like load, I don't know, four or five other modules, like we'll see in Google Maps. So this usually happens by, you know, document create element script, script source, module, blah, so it's very often static, and then it's just like document body append child s. So the problem is this dynamically created script does not have the nonce, right? So it will not execute, these people block it, and your application will break. So what you could do is you could manually propagate this nonce to the dynamically created scripts, but this usually only works if you have like full control of the library, right? If it's your code, you can just propagate the nonce manually. If you use like Google Maps, yeah, well, Google Maps has to fix, like has to introduce this nonce propagation. So it's actually not really working in most applications, unfortunately. Um, and it's hard to refactor that if you're just a developer, right? So we'll show you in a second how we think we can fix that, but very briefly, how do CSP nonces work? Um, we have a policy here with like nonce random in the script tag. The image will still load because the default source is self, and the script nonce random uh, source yep slash x dot gs will also load because the nonce value matches the nonce value of the policy. <coughs> Sorry. So, if an attacker injects an inline script or tries to source a script from somewhere else, it will prevent it from loading, right? Because inline scripts are not allowed if they don't have the nonce, and sourcing scripts are all, is also not allowed if they don't have the correct nonce. And the attacker actually does not know the nonce, right? It's like an XSRF, uh, XSRF token. The attacker usually does not know the nonce because it's like per response, and the next response will have already been changed and would not work. So maybe a quick demo? Yes. Uh, this will be very quick because I think we have a little more than 10 minutes left. So. <clears throat> 12, thanks. Be really quick. So script, uh, script source nouns random. This means that if you have script nouns random alert one, it works, but if you don't know the nouns, so you just have a normal injection, this gets blocked. And if you have Google Maps here, you see that it's still blocked. Sorry, Google Maps announced. Because even if this original JavaScript is allowed, it's trying to load at runtime dynamically common.js, map.js, util.js, stats.js, and these are blocked because there is no nonce propagation method. So, a possible solution, uh, what we thought of and what we uh, already uh, propose in the CSP3 uh, specification, is to add a new source expression to script SOC, which we call strict dynamic. The strict dynamic uh, source expression is um, aims to make CSP uh, deployment simpler and is um, CSP with this new source expression 
should work out of the box. So deployment should be much easier uh, and are aimed at web application developers who have a high degree of, conf of confidence on what they put in the markup, but low confidence in being able to um, come up with a reasonable whitelist. And as we showed, I think, uh, extensively before, this is always the case. So uh, basically, strict dynamic is a trust a propagation mechanism. So, but it does not apply indiscriminately. indiscriminately. So basically, if you have a non-script and you create a script, you put a source and then you append child, then it is as if it were known to. So this is allowed. But if you have other uh, APIs which are more unsafe and which is uh, what like technically uh, are called parser inserted because basically the browser uh, it's uh, the browser uh, um, interprets them as if it were markup. So they are, let's say, more freeform styles such as document write or uh, inner HTML, then they are still blocked. This is because uh, these kind of APIs are uh, very dangerous and this would open up the attack surface uh, unnecessarily. So strict dynamic has two main effects. So the dynamic part, I think, is pretty clear there is a trust propagation mechanism. You know, you know a script? Every script that is dynamically loaded by that script is also blessed and trusted. The strict part is that it drops the whitelist. So even if you have a whitelist, then it is dropped. This is done because most likely your CSP was useless already because you had a whitelist. And uh, we, have, we have data right to back this up and also we want to make CSP backward compatible. So we want to create a single policy that works in all browsers. So browsers, they have a CSP3 compatible, they are CSP3 compatible, they are CSP2 compatible, and then they are uh, CSP1 compatible. So this is the one, the, I mean, one policy you need to use everywhere. You don't have to whitelist, you don't have to come up with a whitelist, you don't have to white to maintain a whitelist anymore. So you have to pass a nonce and nonce every script you trust. You have to add the strict dynamic, which is the shiny new thing. And then these two things that might look unsafe, but then we'll show in a second why we put them, unsafe in line and HTTPS. Or HTTP if you are over HTTP, you shouldn't be. So in a CSP3 compatible browser, so with strict dynamic support, basically strict dynamic is respected. Unsafe in line is dropped because there is a nonce. The specification says that if there is a nonce, unsafe in line is ignored. And HTTPS is dropped because it's a whitelist. And as I said, strict dynamic drops the whitelist. So this is basically nonce and dynamic trust propagation. Nothing else allowed. If it is a CSP2 compatible browser, let's say uh, Firefox right now, uh, well, strict dynamic it doesn't really understand it, so it's ignored. Uh, the nonce, well, it has non support, so it honors the nonce. It, um, basically um, drops unsafe in line, but it doesn't drop the whitelist. So you can still, um, you allow basically every script. So this is a no op. This is not useful for access protection, but it does not um, break your application. And similarly for CSP1, if you don't have non support, basically it's unsafe in line HTTPS. So uh, I'll show uh, very quickly one example. Uh, we wanted to be uh, extremely clear about the uh, limitations of this approach. Basically, since there, there is this trust propagation mechanism, it's very important to note that if you have this kind of vulnerability, which is a very specific vulnerability, basically you have an injection in the source of a document create element script, so in a, a dynamic script loading DOM API, then strict dynamic is probably not for you. And Compared with whitelist-based CSPs, we still think this is a significant reduction of the attack surface. So basically, we, we uh, are going from being able to bypass the vast majority of content security policy, more than 90%, because of mistakes and whitelists. So you were, you were, CSP was useless for access mitigation, most in the vast majority of the, of the cases, to having a secure by default. And also, you were basically depending on other uh, uh, web, I mean, you were 
carrying the burden of other origins you can't control. You don't really know if a, a, white, a, a origin or a path that you are whitelisting actually has JSONP or has Angular or has, you know, even open redirects are, can be a problem. Now, you basically just put trust in what you put. So you have control. You get to control back. You have a secure by default, easy to adopt, with a very low chance of still being uh, bypassable. Uh, we also have some data, and um, this is, of course, not representative of the web, but we, have, we um, did some uh, root cause analysis of the XSS we have at Google, and we found out that this ki kind of uh, vulnerability, uh, like controlling the URL of uh, Mm, uh, dynamic DOM loading, uh, dynamic script loading DOM API is very rare. It's less than 5% uh, of the XSS we uh, have, uh, we know of in Google. So, browser support. Well, Chromium uh, supports strict dynamic already in uh, beta, and we support it in um, <laughs> we support it in uh, stable uh, in the, by the end of July, and. Uh, Firefox uh, supports nonces. Uh, WebKit browsers um, uh, like Safari support nonces, even if it's pretty recent. From uh, they added non support till uh, from like in March of this year. Uh, well, Edge has, does not have really non support, but it's planned. And well, Internet Explorer has a particular view of, of CSP, and it just honors the sandbox attribute. So. I wanted to show you very quickly uh, an example. So you remember before I did uh, script to see nonce, and then I loaded maps nonced, and there was a problem because it was loading dynamically those scripts and it was not working. Well, if you just add strict dynamic, it works. Was the folder still nonced? Sorry? Was the folder still so. The callback with the alert, you mean, from previously? Yes, but just this one is nonced, right? And the attacker would need to change it, and he does not know the nonce, right? So he cannot use that JSMP trick again, S right? So basically, yeah. an attacker would have to inject a script tag with the correct nonce to add callback use payload, right? And he does not the nonce. So yeah. you are protected against that, yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, he asked if you, uh, with uh, string dynamic, you are still uh, vulnerable to, um, since this is also host JSON P endpoint, if you're vulnerable and you, an attacker could add this payload here in the callback. And you can't because the attacker doesn't, attacker know, the doesn't know the nonce, right? Okay. So basically, uh, our point is that string dynamic makes uh, CSP easier to deploy and more secure. This is not just uh, theoretical. Uh, this has been already deployed on several complex Google applications uh, with millions of monthly users, of course. And uh, we uh, proven that it works out of the box and we um, implemented that in, uh, <clears throat> it works for widgets out of the box. So we, we have this uh, test bed uh, down there and you can check that Google Maps, Facebook, Twitter, Recaptcha, Google Charts, all the widgets work out of the box. But also um, we implemented it in uh, part of Maps, uh, part of Google History, um, career search. There are very complex and JavaScript heavy web applications that basically worked out of the box without any uh, refactoring or very limited refactoring. So if you um, tried in the past to adopt CSP and gave up because all the refactoring was needed, this is much, much easier and this is much more secure by default. Of course, you still have to get rid, for example, of inline event handlers. Yes, you still have to do that. But you don't have to come up with a whitelist. You don't have to whitelist it. You don't have to maintain it. And so it's a huge relief for, for developers. So it is both simpler and more secure, which is not something that is, uh, it's pretty rare in the security world. Um, this is implemented in Chrome uh, 52. Uh, it's already in the beta channel, as I said. It will be in uh, stable probably in two weeks or so, but surely by the end uh, of July. And uh, we'd love to have any questions. I also want to shout out a big thanks to Mike and the Chrome team. Uh, uh, 
uh, thanks for uh, your presentation. And I have uh, two additions uh, to you. Uh, uh, to you, the first one: uh, if if someone still uh, doesn't use HTTPS for accessing a uh, website, a uh, content security policy can help them uh, to implement uh, HTTPS. Because if you, for example, can uh, uh, can specify HTTPS scheme alone and use as a single header you can uh, you can grab a lot of uh, useful information about mixed content so uh, this is my advice and uh, the second one uh, is uh, about uh, strict dynamic and formerly known uh, as unsafe dynamic so uh, what do you think about uh, limitations uh, related to uh, unsafe eval and uh, dom based access in this case so if if some website uh, still have to use uh, unsafe eval, and uh, as, as I think it's uh, a lot of sites still to use unsafe eval, I don't know, for templates in JavaScript or something like that. So if, we, if this website have uh, DOM based XSS and use uh, strict dynamic, uh, they, uh, so it have uh, b some kind of bypass it because uh, you can inject script and DOM based XSS and uh, so if you, if you have a paradigm on white lists, so you, 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 you haven't such bypass. So what do you think about it? Okay, so for the first thing, like detecting mixed content and getting, for example, notifications about uh, mixed content, yes. What you can simply do is default SOC HTTPS, and basically every resource that is loaded not over HTTPS, but HTTP triggers a violation, so you will uh, find out even if in very remote parts of your applications you, you have uh, some load somewhere from HTTP. This still happens, it happens even in major projects, so it's an important point. Also, upgrade, upgrade insecure requests directive, right? Right, upgrade, upgrade uh, insecure request is also very nice because even if you put HTTP, it's ask, it's... Um, you want to ask the second one? Or I okay. Yeah, so uh, uh, if you have unsafe evil, well, you don't really have a strict CSP. So uh, unsafe evil usually is not a problem. Uh, most of the times it's not, a, it's not a problem because it depends on how bad is your code. So if your code, a lot of times uh, you need unsafe evil because of module loading. So there are a lot of um, bootstrapping code that basically eval constants. If you eval constants, that's fine. And in our experience, this is the vast majority of the cases. That we don't have numbers, but yes. Also, if you would have like uh, CSP with unsafe evil and it is like safe otherwise, for example, with uh, nonsense, right? You would still reduce the attack surface from reflected and stored XSS to only a subset of DOM XSS that uh, abuses the evil channel, right? So this is still a massive reduction. And yeah, you would need to have a particular bug that abuses it, right? But yes, I uh, don't want to deflect like the question. Yes, so if you have a non-script and you have any kind of JavaScript code injection in that non-script, uh, which is in, for example, like a, DOM, uh, a script loading API, or alternatively, it is the same, actually, it's even more powerful, uh, evil, but you have to have like really an evil string plus tainted plus something, yes, that would be executed. It would be executed if you had unsafe evil anyway, because you would have to whitelist, either whitelist or, you know, it's not because of strict dynamic, it's, it would have been a problem even in the old version of CSP. On your way out, you'll see a green card and a red card in a pile. Please pick one and put it in the, in the bucket so you can evaluate how, how this talk was. And please, a warm round of applause for such a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Thank you a lot. Grazie mille.